Thank you so much, Professor Bea, and thank you all for attending this, what has becoming annually probably the most stimulating um, scientific session um, in the country, um, and I'm really happy and privileged to be here today. We will try in this very brief conversation to talk about a very big topic, um, big data, and we will try to see about the hope, the hype, and some of the perils that are associated with it. So we're in an interesting times right now. Um, you know, the Jules Verne's of the modern age, the futurists, are finding it more and more difficult to make predictions about the future because it's becoming too quick for them. There was a very interesting Forbes uh, article about the fact that the futurists are no longer being able to, to keep track. By the time they have their predictions, it's already passed. And so this is an interesting time to live in, I gotta tell you. And one of the big things that we hear about in the recent years is the topic of big data and the impact of big data on life sciences. And indeed, this is a, a real big topic. And I think, uh, let me see, very strange, good. And I think that the, the issue that we're talking about right now is the issue that we see here in the picture. We are all in a time in which we need to decide which of the paths on the sign we're going to take. Are we going to evolve? Are we going to stand those great disruptions? Or that the other option is also viable? We'll talk today about what is big data, why are we talking about big data suddenly now, and where all of this is taking us. So when we talk about big data, we have to understand it's really big. If we take physical sizes to understand the sheer size, when we're talking about the megabytes or the gigabytes, which is what we are all tackling daily, it would be in the size of an ant or size of a person. Now, the current sizes we're talking about in terms of the big data that people are analyzing are in petabytes and exabytes. So exabytes, for instance, is the size of the sun. So, and this has transformed within a decade in the amount of, of data that we are studying and going through. This is a big change. Now, all of this big data is going to increase in velocity and in size. And one of the things we are seeing now that every person is likely to generate more than one million gigabytes of health-related data in their lifetime, which is approximately 300 million books from every person. We need to store this data, we need to analyze it, we need to make, make sense of it, and hopefully to make good use of it. So, where does all of this, you know, where are all those gigabytes coming from? They're coming from a, a lot of tr more traditional sources, first of all. There's the digital trails of everything we do, every supermarket purchase that we have, everything we do in real life leave a digital track, and nowadays we record it. Every video that we're taking, every picture we're taking with our cell phones. Then there's, in this, let's say, in the realm of healthcare, we have the electronic medical records. And finally, we have all the online activity that we have. But the real big data is going to come from completely different new sources. You know, everybody take a look at your wrists. Um, most likely, if you are below the age of 40, you have nothing there. And if you are above the age of 40, most likely you have something that's uh, uh, connected to, uh, to your wrist. Now, this is very interesting, and it's going to flip in two years. In two years, most likely, if you are below the age of 40, you will have uh, something going on there. And I don't know about vice versa, but this is something that is changing as we see it. And this is the old source. The new things are going to be things that we wear, tattoos on our skin, as was mentioned in the brilliant uh, speech to, uh, this morning by uh, um, Professor Peter uh, Fitzgerald, which uh, gave a wonderful presentation that led to all of this. Now, here are some additional sources. Have you considered your toilets as a source of big data? So uh, when you ask people in the United States whether or not they will be willing to have sensors there that will take um, your urine samples as you go along, uh, the answer is surprisingly highly uh, yes. They are willing, and now we're able, and we have the carpets that will uh, let us know if we're treading too lightly or too heavily. Uh, and the first signs of Parkinson's might come from our carpets. We, there are now contact lenses developed by Google that will take all of your metrics and, as in real time, have all of this data put on your, any recorder that you have. It could be a cell phone, by then it will be something else. You have your beds, you have your homes, all the home will be monitored. Everything you do is already monitored, it will only increase. And all of this data will be accumulated, so that's big data. That's a lot of data. Now, in Nature Biotechnology, just a few weeks ago, there was a list of companies that are already taking track of some of all of this data and are using it for vast uh, um, uses. But this is just the beginning because these, all of these things are talking 
between themselves. It's called the Internet of Things. They are starting to communicate and, and communicate, and the fridge is going to talk with your cupboard, which is going to talk with your wristwatch and your car, and they will know what's happening. I mean, you might not know, but they will know. And they will communicate in more, more and more intricate ways. They already do, just not uh, as a parent. Now, one more layer on all of this big data is the omics. Now, we all think about our genome. It's usually what we think about. You know, we'll decipher the genome and we'll know all the uh, ACGs, etc., of our... But that's only the beginning, because this is fairly constant. The structure of our, ge of our genome is fairly constant. There's a lot of other layers out there which are changing constantly within our genome. Some, there are different names, and we'll not go into epigenetics, but there are things that change in our genome as we live and between different tissues. And there's a reason why with the same DNA, one tissue looks like a liver and the other one looks like an eye. And, but it's the same genetic structure. And the reasons to that have to do with all of that, and that is changing through your life cycle. So imagine that this will be continuously documented and be a, a part of this big data. And then again, every, you know, you have, prob you have more um, bugs uh, in your um, uh, guts then you have cells in your body. And they will really make the difference about how well you are and whether or not you have diabetes, for instance. And all of this data will also be accumulated. So that's really, really a lot of data. And there are now projects that are trying to take people, take all of their omics, all of their sensor-driven data, and know what's the normal. Hundreds, and it's going to 10,000 now, and we will know what's your baseline. Like, we know by now what's your normal phenotypic structure should be. We will know what's your basic genotype and what your basic epigenetics and your basic sensor data should look like, and we can know about differences and when it's skewed. So, what does all this mean? We will have a whole lot of data. Yeah, I know. Um, so, yes, why, Grandma? What big data you have? Um, so, this is a, an interesting beginning point, because big data by itself is of little u utility. And where it comes to become interesting is this topic of artificial intelligence. Now, this sounds something from a futuristic movie that we've probably seen, and what is this guy talking about? But you're all using AI every day. It has different names. It's called deep learning. It's called co co cognitive analytics. And whenever you use Waze, when you use Siri, um, you know, in your little mobile, you don't have all the brain of Siri that tell, interprets what you told the iPhone and then it, it answers you back. It's somewhere there in the cloud with a very complex set of neural networks that allow them to make this inference. You don't know it, but you're doing artificial intelligence every day. Even your spam filter on your email has a really complex way of doing artificial intelligence. So, and this is just the beginning. On May, and I'll give you just one example so you'll understand what an exciting period this is right now. There's a very famous test to how artificial intelligence is doing. And it's called the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. And it's run for many years now, at least, uh, um, quite a, at least seven years now. And it's a benchmark for image recognition. And you let an expert human decide which would go within each category, and they're wrong in about 5% of the times. And for many years, this was the benchmark because com computers couldn't get even close. They got to 28% wrong, 25% wrong, and they slowly, slowly got better. And then suddenly, in 2012, they put deep learning into this equation. And suddenly, Microsoft hit 4.94. And the Chinese, we talked a little about that today, are already at 4.58. They're much better than the humans in doing this. So this is an interesting way towards the Turing test. Um, if we take a look at, uh, just in May uh, uh, 2015, I collected some sample of things. Computers now uh, have solved the problem of how to listen in a cocktail party to a talk. You know, that's a unique human trait. You sit in a cocktail party, everybody's talking, but you can still understand what the person was saying. Until now, computers couldn't do that, now they can. Um, they can identify which type of art they're looking at better than the art scientists now, you know, better than, than the people who do this. Um, they make, uh, by now, there's chefs that automatically create new and interesting uh, food. Um, there's um, rap songs being written by computers, uh, interestingly. And the worst part, um, they win at poker. Computers now actually bluff better than humans do. And they win. So leave alone chess. I mean, no, chess is easy, but poker? That is, uh, yeah, well, that, there's, there's a problem there. Something is happening and something is really, really changing here, and it's changing very quickly. And the CEO of IBM just said a few weeks ago, he said, uh, uh, she said, um, every decision that mankind makes is going to be informed by a cognitive system. We're not going to make decisions ourselves very soon. 
That would be something like deciding which road to go without ways. Doesn't make sense. Um, and all of those insights, what do we do with them? So um, Eric Topol is one of the, the people who has foreseen some of this happening. And he's wrote, written quite a while ago about the creative destruction of medicine. And he said that everything is going to change. Nothing is going to stay as we know it. And we are working in a very, very traditional conservative system. We don't like changing. And it's really risky to make changes because we're dealing with people's lives here. So it's, you know, the space industry and the health industry are probably the most conservative ones out there. Um, but the potential is too great to, to, to just ignore. You can do so much more. I would say that some of the people here who work in healthcare management will agree with me that we can improve efficiency of our systems. Um, there's so much to do better, and some of these ways systems can help us in that. Just so you know, right now, less than 50% of the medical decisions that are actually made are evidence-based. They're based about every other thing. We heard before that when you make policy, you wouldn't even go into uh, you know, evidence-based policy. You would live well with evidence-driven policy, or at least t t people will know the evidence as they ignore it. Now, it seems like that in medicine and in clinical medicine, it's not that much far from that, although we would like to think we're doing evidence-based practice. There are many other things we can do with all of this data and all of this artificial intelligence, and it's pretty definite that our decision-making is going to be draw driven by all of those systems of uh, consultation and artificial intelligence in many of these realms, but additional others. Which brings us back to Maimonides and to the old saying that an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. And it is true. When you try to tackle a disease very early, it is much easier, much less costly, much less painful, and more likely to succeed. When we try to tackle diabetes in its latest stages, when all of the pathological damage to the er end organs are there, you can drop all of the medications you'd like on the A1Cs. It will make very little clinical benefit, probably more damage than benefit. If you go earlier upstream, there's a higher chance you can make a difference. But how can you go upstream? There's not enough money in the system. And if we we'll go upstream on everyone, everybody in this room would like preventive care, but we don't have enough resources. You need to know which one to go to and what to do with each one of them. And for that, you need a really good crystal ball. But we don't have a crystal ball. But the thing is that now we do. And this is not futurism. This is presenteeism. This is happening now and has been happening, for instance, Clalit is one example for the last seven years at least. Uh, we have in Clalit a research institute that does exactly this. We do big data analytics. We do preventive modeling, preventive services based on proactive, predictive modeling. And for instance, uh, if we look at uh, the risk of someone to have dialysis, if we look at this room, about 10% of the people sitting here have right now stage three CKD chronic kidney disease they don't know nothing about. Their creatinine level is in a way which is midway towards a problem. 99% of these will live happily ever after, but 1% will go to dialysis. How do I know who's the 1%? Because if I would, I can't treat all of 10% of everybody sitting here with preventive treatment, but if it's 1% of them, I can do that. But how do I know which one? But you can. Nowadays, we created a model that allows us to know in a hundred a hundredfold difference, which one is the high, really highest likelihood to go on dialysis. And we have an active program of proactively going to these people and treating them early and trying to prevent the problem from coming and becoming a reality. We do the same thing for readmission, something very critical for this uh, uh, establishment, for instance. It has been said here in the JAMA that readmission risk prediction is really complicated, and it's true. But we have been able to actually do this, and we have a model that's ongoing, and this is not in theory. When every morning in Clalit, when a nurse opens her computer in the morning, she sees a list of all the patients that were discharged ranked by their probability of coming back to readmission. And she has a procedure of what to do with these patients. So predictive modeling-based uh, um, practice is not future, it's present and it's only ensuing. We have by now six models in action, and we have six more in progress. And this is only becoming more and more. But what does that mean? This means that the whole paradigm is changing. You know, right now we try to treat people with early disease before their full-scale disease, but this is changing. We're gonna go to a different place. We're gonna go a lot, lot, lot more upstream to a pre-pathology uh, uh, state and start treating people then. And the whole type of care that we're gonna give is gonna be different. And this means, for instance, that you, none of you is healthy, okay? You are pre-disease. 
Okay? You may laugh for a second, but think about it. Okay? Okay? This is a temporary condition of health, and um, we have a cure for that. Um, so, but seriously speaking, um, making clinical decisions is going to be very, very difficult very, very soon. By now, we can make decisions based on five phenotypic aspects. In very soon, none of you clinicians will be able to make this. You will need, at the beginning, 10, and then 100, and then a thousand different variables in your mind calculated to make the right clinical decision, or you will make the wrong decision and maybe get sued, or just the patient will have damage. One of the two. You can't. So this is changing rapidly, and this is becoming a present. So the roles of the patient are changing. There's new players in the industry. And I think one point I want to make, which is a continuation of what Peter said earlier today, is that there's a real risk to the classical establishment, hospitals, kupot cholim. The, the earth is shaking. And the landscape is changing. And those that will not adapt will end up with a Kodak moment. You all remember a very famous company that thought they had the world in their palm. And there's a classic industry that is so long there and it's not going to change. And they have slowly adapted. Um, and then suddenly it wasn't good enough. And they're gone. So any organization who doesn't want to have a Kodak moment would probably need to make some of these adjustments very soon. This is not just you know, a hope. There's also perils. We should take into account the problem of risk fatigue. How much of this you're going to be sick can you take? After two times, you're, you, that's enough of that, right? There's, there's alert fatigue and there's risk fatigue. And there's a problem of signal to noise that has never been solved yet. It's just a question. Everybody's sure that it's solvable. But I haven't seen the application that solved this problem and have shown that it's actually leading to improved outcome and is acceptable. You know, uh, one of three Americans stopped using their wearables they bought in the last six months. So it's not so clear that this is something that's going to be uh, as impactful as we'd like. And don't forget that there's also risks associated with data. The hand that holds the data is going to be the most impactful one in, the, in this arena. So issues like this would become very, very frightening because imagine what they can do when the real big data of everything that you have and you do will be there. So it is something, privacy is something to consider. And yet, as Vinod Koshla said, and he's one of the people who made quite a good, m much of money using, uh, uh, working in classic industries, but he says, data science and software will do more for medicine than all the biological sciences together. And I think he's right. And I think we can, in Israel, we can be the global leaders in digital health. We have everything here that we need. We have the best minds. We're the startup nation. We have all of the infrastructure, we have data that no other country has. Khalid has in its uh, uh, databases data on four and a half million, if you take the deceased, over six million people for over a decade and a half, everything. Phenotypic data, um, the, the classic uh, diagnosis, the medication, the outcomes. There's so much we're doing and there's so much more that can be done. Um, the world is actually do, uh, is turning to us. The institute was recognized as a WHO uh, uh, lead center to uh, work with the European uh, um, countries and promote this type of, of thinking, and we're trying to do that. But finally, we really have to understand that we need to either evolve or we'll have some serious issues to deal with. Thank you so much.